right now, we have 200 years ago, the richest countries were three times richer than the poorest. 200 years ago, the richest countries were three times richer than the poorest. Today, the richest countries in the world are 80 times richer than the poorest. Today, the richest countries in the world are 80 times richer than the poorest. In fact, Richard Wilkinson coined this phrase, social evaluation anxiety. The threats to our social esteem and social status by having a sense of how we're valued or not. He talks at length about how inequality shows that on every single measure, life expectancy, literacy, homicide, imprisonment, mental illness, drug addiction and trust, the more economically unequal the country, the more harmful to a society. And they have now gone down to measure each of these indicators. It is incredible work and very, very, very important that we think about what is the macro problem that we're facing here, not just dive into our micro that, that hits us every day and that we see every day. So innovation is obviously happening in every sector and it needs to. It needs to for us, in order for us to think differently about some of these macro issues, we are going to have to innovate and think differently. Of course, you know, one of the greatest disruptions in the world right now is this thing called Uber, which has transformed an industry that was pretty stagnant and pretty much had it all sewn up. And yet Uber have pretty effortlessly just come into the market and changed the game dramatically and forever, not just in one country or two countries, but around the world. In your closer to home in your sector or in the, on the fringes of your sector, we are seeing some of the most disruptive um, elements. Now, Seek and Career One, you could call, were originally incremental disruptions. They didn't mess up the whole sector. They just came and did their piece. But you look now at Freelancer and Fiverr and some of the, the, the agencies that are actually allowing you to offshore jobs that you would normally hire people to do here pretty effortlessly and displacing people here. Expert 360 is going to displace the normal recruitment agencies from top-end providers and they already have raised $5 million in funds to do that. And all they're doing is picking off individuals and placing them on new projects. The long-term unemployment space that lots of you are in is obviously harder and more difficult. But the fact is that there is funds and there is money that is attached to those places and therefore it is ripe for innovation and will be. The only question that I have for you is will you innovate it or will somebody from completely left field create and undertake that innovation for you and on your behalf? The potential social impacts of innovation in this space are huge, obviously political and social, but also potentially financial if somebody decides to do it differently. So what are the conditions for innovation? Well, wide, worldwide, we've analyze that there's a couple of things that are really key. Number one, hungry for innovation. So you really, really, really want it, it creates focus. There is incentive, for whatever reason, there is incentive that you have and you want to have skin in the game. There's diversity, you really want outside thinking and new ideas, and so you go and seek diversity. And self-determination, much innovation is being driven by people actually stepping up and into their own lives and deciding to take control. And the other condition for innovation, which is the hardest and might I say the most difficult in this country at the moment is risk. So we are now known as one of the most risk averse countries on the planet. Even in business, we are extremely risk averse. So where there is clear money to be made, we are in Australia one of the most risk averse countries. And yet, we're, let alone in the social sector where there is high risk um, and obviously not as much money to be made but great social outcomes, we remain risk averse. And so lots of us are thinking about how do you change that risk appetite in Australia. 
So the challenges of innovation are very clear and you will have experienced some of these. Traditional organisations often kill innovation. <laughs> Just organisational culture. Those people who are the yes but chickens as we call them. Yes but, yes but, yes but, yes but. There are heaps of them in every organisation. Red tape and bureaucracy kill innovation. Some people just prefer slow and steady growth. And obviously hierarchy is a real danger also because you don't let people free. If you can't let your people free, they can't innovate. And employees have no skin in the game. Well, here's an innovation challenge for you. You could fire your best staff. You could give them a three month payout and tell them to put you out of business and then offer to invest in their great ideas. If you don't want to go that far, you could do what Nesta has done. And Nesta is a great case study that I really want to talk to you about. Started in 1988 in the UK, endowed by the UK lottery. Its goal is to incubate and scale disruptive innovation for public good. Their approach is basically to connect social innovators frontline service providers and policy makers in every single project that they take on. They fund a portfolio of innovators and innovations towards a common goal. They set up what are called challenge prizes and encourage people to work together to win money to get their social ideas up. And they structure an innovation program that helps organisations individually. They then set up these things called I-teams. And I-teams look like this. They have a bias towards action and rapid experimentation. You'll, you hear a lot in this sector about rapid prototyping in R&D. So that idea where you get micro experiments and actually really try things quickly and fast. And the key here is about nimbleness. So don't load people down with processes, structures and all these policies, just let them be nimble. There is a diverse mix of skills. The best innovation teams actually bring people from outside of your organisation and wait outside of your entire industry into those teams to work with them. They measure impacts. They stop, they stop and they stop immediately what isn't working, which is a massive challenge in our sector. We are so slow to stop things that aren't working because we get very invested in them and because we're dealing with real people's lives and we don't want to let them down. But the measure of impact is that you can stop what isn't working. They have strong links to people who make decisions and they celebrate success and they share credit. In the UK, one of the first things that Nexus did was something called People Powered Health Program. They co-designed with patients, doctors, health workers, over 18 months in six locations, new approaches to managing conditions like diabetes. They began by analysing broader systems challenges and they shifted their healthcare approach to peer and prevention, peer focused and preventative focused. And then they made a heap of experiments, most of which of course failed because that's what experiments are for, to test ideas. And then a coalition of organisations came around the best ideas and then gave, they gave them momentum. And finally, the policy makers came and started to change the conditions in which these organisations or these new projects could work. They iterated all the time and the balance of the best social innovators are this ability to manage micro experiments, macro policy conditions, practical demonstrations and then advocate. A key skill in tackling social problems in the future is going to be those four things. Can you conduct micro experiments, quick, nimble experiments? Can you deal with macro policy conditions? Can you do practical demonstrations that people can look at? And can you advocate to policymakers? The innovations in that one program, People Powered Health in the UK, have saved $4.4 billion to the UK public health system. And the outcome, so that, you know, lots of you would say, well, that's amazing. Congratulations, your work is done here. However, the outcomes that were then measured above and beyond that are improved patient satisfaction, well-being, 
and Nesta have now gone on to work in aged care, to work in all kinds of different areas, including cities. One of the most significant issues in our world coming down the pipeline is cities. As people rush to urban centres to find work in, in areas and times of high unemployment, our cities are going to be completely redesigned. So cities are their next issue. That's what good innovation looks like, but it takes an innovative team with these kind of skill sets and this kind of mindset. Over at FYA, I want to give you a closer to home um, example. So this is what we're dealing with as the Foundation for Young Australians. Over 60% of the world's young people live in our region, our back door. That's 750 million young people and young women and men aged 15 to 24 years. We have 4.3 million of those in Australia. By the way, we're the only OECD in the world that has a growing youth population. So in the next 25 years, we will have 50% more young people than we do now. So that inverted pyramid in all OECDs of an ageing population, and yes, we do have a rapidly ageing population, we're one of the few OECDs that will have 50% more young people in the next 25 years. That's because we all had one for the country, thanks to Peter Costello. <laughs> it worked. So one of the most, you know, it, amazing opportunities that we actually have in Australia and the Reserve Bank have pointed this out, Philip Lowe, the head of Reserve Bank, is he said, Australia, do you know that you have more young people and a growing population of young people which puts you in an exceptional place because you're going to have more? Not only does that mean more services and schools, 100 schools alone in the next 15 years will need to be built in Victoria with all the teachers, with the infrastructure, with everything that goes with it. But the fact is that we have this resource, this incredible resource. But if our resource is not ready and able to match the 750 million, well, minus 4.3 million, in our region, then we will not be able to stand beside them as the world unfolds in a very new and different way. And our young people, our next generation, will suffer. We have, and our OECD friend just told us that underemployment is one of the most significant issues in the world at the moment. It's fantastic to have an education. It's not fantastic to have a $40,000 debt as you leave education and to not be able to get a job because you trained in a field that will no longer be exist because 44% of that industry or those industries are going to be automated. So we need to think very differently and that's what we're doing at FYA. So we very much believe that innovation and entrepreneurship are going to drive social and economic progress. And behind every single great innovation, anywhere in the world that I've seen, there have been a group of entrepreneurs. Whether it was a Steve Lawrence at the beginning of Job Futures, whether it was a woman out of the unions in the 1970s who set up superannuation in Australia. There are people within organisations, and I like to call them intrapreneurs, who have this mindset. And if you're going to survive and if you're going to innovate, you have to find those people who have got that entrepreneurial mindset. And even if they're in an organisation, we call them intrapreneurs. I happen to have 70 of them at FYA, and it's not easy working with 70 under 30-year-olds who are all wanting to be entrepreneurs and actually really um, are being entrepreneurial inside our organisation. It's fantastic, and I'm very fortunate, and it's not the easiest job to manage all that. So what we did was we said, let's go hard on this this year. Let's set up a big campaign called Innovation Nation, a thousand ideas for a better Australia. Let's harvest from young Australians the best thousand ideas that they have for a better Australia. And so we ran this campaign for two months. And because we wanted to get this funnel open, we wanted a big funnel of ideas. Remember that eight out of 10 ideas or even eight out of 10 startups fail. So it's incredibly important in Australia that we have this 
passion and interest in ideas and we don't get attached to them and we don't fear failure and everything goes to hell. You know, in the US, your badge of honour is how many times you've failed before you front up to a VC, a venture capitalist here. If you front up as a failure, they're like, well, we can't touch you. <laughs> We're very sorry it's been, you know, wonderful um, and good luck with the rest of your life. But we, there are in other cultures very, very, very different views to innovation and failure. So we ended up with 800 ideas and 200 projects. We then chose 52 young people, and we call them young social pioneers, and we put them into six streams of innovation. And they are, have been backed by a different corporate partner, and Corporate Australia has been very interesting in this. I, like a lot of you, I run a non-profit. I fundraise all the time, that's my job. 75% of my time is fundraising. I've never had so many people run at our organisation idea as I had with this idea, because so many people know that their industry or that their organisation or that their sector is under threat. And if they don't innovate, they will not survive. And so we've had partners running at us to help us run these streams and run this program. I'm amazed at what we had. We had a 15-year-old from, boy from Brisbane who turned up at this program with something that he'd built after school in his garage, which is a tablet that clicks together like Lego and will be provided all around the world to young people in schools as a build-your-own tablet um, as of next year. A 15-year-old. He created it when he was 14, by the way. And I suspect that Taj will be one of Australia's great innovators with many, many, many more to come. But from Taj through to people like Lucy, uh, Rosie Thomas, who uses Twitter to run a very effective campaign about raising awareness about mental illness and what needs to be done better, faster, quicker, smarter, funnier for young people. These young people use tech as their drivers of their innovations and ideas, and mostly they use this opportunity to think very fast. So we bring them into an accelerator, an incubator, we crawl all over their idea, they come out of the incubator in six months with an idea, with a whole heap of project management skills, a massive network, because one of the things you don't have when you're young because it takes a lifetime to develop is a network. And so we link them with a network, we give them capabilities and skills, and they have clarity of purpose from working with each other on each other's projects about what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing. 52 young people. We now have 120 young Australians, the largest cohort of young social entrepreneurs in the country inside FYA. By the way, on top of that, we have the largest cohort of young indigenous next generation leaders who, using the tools of social media, have run campaigns on issues that they care about. And by the way, the number one issue that these indigenous young people care about in Australia is asylum seekers. Number two, climate. Number three, close the gap in their education. And I find it incredible that Indigenous young Australians, that is their top three priorities. And using tools of social, they then ran campaigns and designed campaigns to reach 50,000 other Australians as next generation leaders. So between Young Social Pioneers, our Indigenous Youth Leadership Academy, and then ADAPT, which is our App Creation Academy, where we enable young people to create apps for social good not just to play games or to buy something, but to actually create social good. We've seen a real movement of young entrepreneurs and that's what we're driving at FYA, to start to innovate change in our community. Finally, I wrote um, a book last year called The Future Chasers. I really wanted to capture these young people in Australia right now, and a couple of them are going to be here presenting over the next few days, including Elliot Costello um, and some of the others. But the thing that distinguishes these young leaders and up-and-coming innovators in Australia is this idea of epic meaning. I genuinely can change the way things are. And we tell young people the decisions that have been made to get us where we are now, today, in our country, are just decisions that we've made. And it is incredibly important that we 
empower young people with that message. You do not have to inherit and you do not have to live by and create the future based on the decisions of the people that made them before you. And so that sense of epic meaning and that sense of young people who see themselves as globally connected but want to live very, very connected lives in their local community is the world in which our young people walk. They have an urgent ambition and they definitely have no borders and that enables them to be amazing change makers. The other thing that is so different to when I started my journey, and I pretty much started my journey right here in Old Parliament House actually as a young activist. Um, I spoke, I think, at publicly at the very first time ever at the taxation summit that was run by Bob Hawke and I was the only young person in the room. And it was a pretty amazing experience. And this place was an amazing place because you could walk any corridor and bump into the Prime Minister, the Treasurer. You could stand outside the Prime Minister's door just about and hear the shouting match between him and Keating on any given day. <laughs> it was an amazing place to be born into as an activist. And that's what happened to me and I was so lucky. But the paddock was so small. It was this small. It was as small as this place. And what our young innovators and entrepreneurs have today is these incredible mix of disciplines. So we see architects, doctors, lawyers, accountants, tradies coming to this space of social innovation and working with other young people who have come out of nonprofits, who have come out of corporates, who have come out of entrepreneurship and starting their own thing. And that is, to me, the most magnificent thing that's happened that is the most significant change from when I started my journey right here in this building, that we have cross-disciplines, cross-sectors, and I, therefore, am relentlessly positive about what our young people will yet do, what they will yet become and what they will yet take our nation to. Our job may be, really, in the end, just to get out of the way. Thank you.